Buenas noches, Zermanana Cidres. Welcome back to part two of the Candid News Group's three part series into the Alvindia corruption scandal. I'm Johnny Rosario with Candid News. And I'm Troy Torres. Tonight, we bring you the closing piece of part two of this series, and tomorrow night, Johnny will bring you the final part of this series before our coverage begins into the second trial of Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser before Judge Francis Tybinko Gatewood in the United States District Court of Guam. We brought you riveting details into the conspiracy to entrap Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser in the crimes they are accused of committing, and how one of their attorneys proclaimed in open court that the government, with their star witness manipulating his way into freedom from his crimes and corruption against society, framed Martinez and Moser. Let's say that the only questionable issue the defense had with the government was on the entrapment scheme. Something like that may trigger the suppression of evidence on constitutional grounds. Uh, same with the issues with the warrant. Setting aside for the moment the possibility that either of those two failures by the government to pursue justice within the bounds of the Constitution, let's wonder out loud what the jury will see. But the short of it is that jurors, no matter how the evidence got to them through the trial process, will have the central pieces of evidence in the case, the two buckets of methamphetamine. But jurors did not have evidence that the two buckets of methamphetamine sitting in front of them in the courtroom are the same two buckets that were allegedly in the van when Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser were told to get out of the vehicle. There are missing links in the chain of custody over the two buckets found behind the driver's seat and the middle console of the van. The buckets were despite contradictory witnesses' statements of their existence was allowed into evidence. Three errors, the entrapment of the defendants, the misuse and eventual destruction of the GPS tracker without a warrant, and the missing chain of custody for the two buckets. Placed together with the inconsistent and false testimony of every government official who testified during the trial. The fact that Blitz alerted to narcotic odor on the GPS tracker and not the contents of the two buckets. The government's failure at every opportunity they had to track and find the supposed source of this alleged methamphetamine by, and the corruption of the very first recorded conversation among Mr. Alvendia, Mr. Martinez, and Ms. Moser, where the original context of the scheme would have been, creates the kind of reasonable doubt that the jurors that with this level of dishonesty permeated through the government's case, it is possible and even likely that Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser were framed. During a sidebar of the first trial, Mr. Lujan tells the court, I do believe, I'm sorry to say this, but that the government is allowing perjured testimony here and that the government is more interested in convicting our clients than ensuring that justice is done. At the pretrial conference for both sides to make their motions, defense attorney Gregory Nicholson expounded on Mr. Lujan's point saying, quote, this trial is the result of a corrupt sting operation. It is one deceptive practice after another. They lied. Why did they do that? Because their entire case was built on deception. This is the big picture of just how corrupt the government is. Imagine being separated from your family and from each other in a jail cell run by a criminal justice system that pays no mind to the criminal organization running rampant by the hands of prison wardens and floor leaders, not just in Guam, but across this country. And not just for a crime you didn't commit, but one that the very government that will incarcerate you for 20 years set you up for and framed you with. 20 years. If they were facing a one-year sentence or even five years behind bars, perhaps an innocent couple with a family to raise may be willing to face the penalties of this entrapment and plea to lesser charges in exchange for their cooperation in other cases. But if they're not even involved in this world, much less other worlds of criminal conduct, then who are they to be the government's next victims? Who would they have to help the government to set up? Fabricate a story of their past that no law enforcement officer previously tailed to establish a lack of credibility and begin the setup. Those questions matter to Henry Alvin Dia. Rather than spending over 20 years in prison for crimes of corruption that he did commit, he took the United States Attorney's get out of jail free card and set up a couple. Who is Henry Alvin Dia? And how did he manage to keep his freedom after carrying out over a decade of dirty work that represents the most corrupt law enforcement racket in the island's history? Could law enforcement officers from two California police departments, federal agents, and possibly even the U.S. Attorney's Office in Guam collude to entrap an innocent couple? 
violate their constitutional rights, cover up those violations, conceal key events of the alleged crime, and make false and misleading statements under oath before a federal court. The answer is simple. They all had something to lose at different points and for different reasons over the span of this legal saga. Remember, it's been more than three years since that traffic stop in Torrance, California. And that's a lot of time for people to meet as strangers, to get to know each other better. Three years for different people's interests to align. These three years to cover up for each other. And then all of a sudden you realize that what you thought was an innocent cover-up is actually part of a master scheme that has its roots at where this corruption tree starts, Henry Alvin Dia. And by that time, it's too late. Either you're the attorney who pushed for his plea bargain, or you're the federal agent who just wanted to help his childhood friend through, through a tough time. Or you're a fed from California who just wanted to do a favor for a colleague from Guam. Or you're a Torrance PD cop trying to impress your federal friends on what sounds like a huge break in a case against what you thought was a Mexican cartel. You're a Redondo Beach PD canine handler who answered a call to help his brothers in the next town. The key to building a band of brothers is to build that brotherhood through a network of opportunity and to keep it together through a boomerang-headed rope of leverage. Henry Alvandia, either by charm, the calling of a favor, or persuasion of the necessity of a situation, build layers of leverage to protect what matters to him, his freedom. The government that held the cards, the one that made him accountable for his criminal corruption, now is eating out of its free hands. The unfortunate irony is that the only way to make the nightmare go away for everyone involved in the scheme is to secure a conviction against Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser. That is the final chapter to a fairy tale ending for Mr. Alvin Dia whose efforts toward this conviction is indeed his redemption. And if that can be described lightly as a gross miscarriage of justice, then Lady Justice will have delivered a stillborn if the scheme succeeds and Alvandia is celebrated as a hero. But an acquittal will be their nightmare. It is believed that the Justice Department will have no mercy for those who drag the U.S. government into this abortion of an operation. Think of the officers of the law who allegedly perjured themselves before federal court. What about the, of the two trials, three years of investigation, and the travel and boarding costs of the witnesses who had to come to Guam for crimes allegedly committed in California that the U.S. taxpayers had to foot? What of the, sc the scrutiny the United States Attorney's Office will almost certainly go through to ascertain their culpability in this scheme? Any wonder now why of all the federal agencies involved, not once does the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency pop up in this case? or why it was a Superior Court of California judge who had to sign the belated warrant for the California GPS tracker and not the District Court for Southern California. Or why was this case brought before the California District Court in June of 2015 and was dismissed for all the reasons we will be covering in the next part of this three-part series. Having peeled back that onion following an acquittal, every layer of leverage Mr. Avendia built will have fallen like a house of cards that meets a gust of wind. He will be exposed at its center, perhaps as nothing but a savvy criminal who did what he needed to do to remain a free man. And right there, Mr. Alvandia will meet his day of reckoning. The federal hand that fed him, the one he bit, at least will have the final word, as his sentencing under the terms of the binding plea agreement will be scheduled by the federal court. The only reason Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser became the target of a federal investigation into drugs is because an admitted liar and corrupt cop, Henry Alvin Villa, as the star witness of the government's case, not federal agents, swore that the couple trafficked drugs. The only reason anyone in the federal government believed him is because one of their agents, a man they were unaware had been his friend since childhood, vouched for him. The only reason the U.S. Attorney's Office in Guam agreed to forego the corruption investigation is because they believed Alvin Diaz's wild claim that he had nothing on Ralph Scambaluri and that a man with tattoos and his wife, devout Christians at that, led the supply chain to Guam for the Mexican cartel, all without the DEA ever appearing in a single court transcript. 
What remains unreasonable or unresolved in the matrix of reasons is when and why the U.S. Attorney's Office in Guam agreed to forego their investigation of the original customs corruption scandal and move on to the Martinez and Moser case. The customs corruption scandal will end with the sentencing of Mr. Alvandia, whether he serves time or not. Mr. Alvandia was the highest of the chain that federal investigators got. And the trafficking of cigarettes was neither the only racket they were after, nor was it the matter of greatest criminality they were investigating. With all those containers and packages arriving at the seaport and the airport, with 100% certainty that Mr. Alvandia would direct or conduct the inspections himself, and with witness accounts of Mr. Alvandia himself removing packages that did not match any of the other descriptions in the bills of lading, something illicit and illegal was being trafficked into Guam in those containers from the ports of Manila and Subic Bay. The key question in unraveling what the federal government has so far failed to do is this. Since July of 2015, when Mr. Alvandia no longer possessed the customs seal nor worked for the agency, has the trafficking of methamphetamine hydrochloride gone down? July of 2015 is an important marker in our understanding of the broader criminal enterprise Mr. Alvandia belonged to, may still be protecting, and most certainly holds leverage over. It certainly and nearly coincides with a period in time when drug activity, as the government of Guam has reported to us, had risen to a point that led to a special customs report and the establishment of the Mendania Drug Task Force. We know from the court transcripts that federal agents were investigating the only person who could vest the authority over the customs seal and detail a customs employee to oversee the agency's evidence lockers filled with narcotics and other proof of criminal complicity needed to convict in the court. Then Customs Chief Ralph Scambaluri. We know from the federal indictment on Mr. Alvandia that there are unnamed, unindicted co-conspirators at Customs involved in the trafficking of illegal goods into Guam. From the time Mr. Scambaluri entrusted Mr. Alvandia with the authority of the Customs seal, the only employee who had such authority and during the period of the Customs Corruption Scandal, which lasted about a decade, reports from the Guam Police Department and the DEA show a rapid rise in methamphetamine use, as well as the decline in its street price. The Guam's Customs Agency, when pressed, began a claim that more and more of the drug was brought to Guam in the mail, which prompted agreements with the U.S. Postal Inspector to beef up surveillance of packages coming to Guam. While there has been a relative success in curbing the air supply of meth, by October 2017, the Postal Inspector reported that for previous fiscal year, 60 pounds of meth was mailed to Guam. Island leaders and the media stupidly celebrated the finding. If you do the math, 60 pounds comes out to the consumption of a gram of meth each day for 73 people. There are far more than 73 people who use meth on a daily basis. There are some families who have more than 73 relatives to the third degree of consanguinity who use meth. Meth by mail theory, while it worked to focus attention on curbing the plane arrivals of the drug supply, it also worked to remove eyes from the cargo transit of the drug aboard sea ships. Consider the fundamental meaning of this logic. If the problem in combating the drug supply was its transportation by mail, and an entire operation managed to curb its supply, then why did Mr. Scambolari's successor, Chief of Customs Vince Perez, report on August 2, 2017, just one year ago, and for a period that covered the year following Mr. Alvin Diaz's retirement, that meth is on the rise. There's only one other way for anything to enter the island if it isn't by air, and that's by sea. But if Mr. Alvandia no longer is at customs to allow those entries of drugs to continue by container shipment, then how is that happening? The federal government celebrated the takedown of Alvandia and his co-conspirators back in 2015 as a major break into the drug supply in Guam. Yet all they had done was stop the trafficking of cigarettes that ironically competed directly with the Calvo family's hold on Marlboro distribution at their company, Midpac. If Martinez and Moser were at the top of the food chain and Alvandia was their key in stopping the supply chain, and if the air arrivals also have been suffocated, then how and why are drugs entering the island at a greater rate?
It is Mr. Alvin Diaz's testimony in his own corruption scandal that was valuable to unlocking the network of the drug supply that the government of Guam has been so eager to mislead the public in the direction of the U.S. Postal Service and away from the commercial seaport, both areas under the province of Guam Customs. If we consider that meth, like any other product that has to be shipped into the island before it makes it into the economy, is transported here by the same proportions as everything else, then 5,940 pounds of the drug supply made it by sea in fiscal year 2017. That comes out to 7,290 people consuming a gram of meth a day for 365 days. And to be more realistic, that equates to 29,162 islanders consuming a quarter gram of crystal meth every day. That is far closer to the reality we live in than the fantasy of only 73 per day consuming meth by mail. If the drug supply truly is at the heart of the customs corruption scandal, then why are narcotics on the rise without the scandal's mastermind, Mr. Alvin Diaz, in possession of the customs seal? And for that matter, how are narcotics on the rise if the supposed drug lords with supposed ties to the Mexican cartel, Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser, were taken out of the business they supposedly operated on June 4, 2015? The answer is that someone else possesses the custom seal or otherwise the authority to declare uninspected sea cargo as ready to leave the foreign zone and enter our streets. Mr. Alvin Diaz, unindicted co-conspirators and which of them remain employed at the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency. Equally important to this discussion is that the abrupt retirement of Ralph Scambaluri shortly after Mr. Alvin Diaz's retirement leaves another question that the CANS group believes will unravel the conspiracy to the real supply of meth that has existed without detection. Who, with the authority to the direct placement of personnel in a law enforcement agency since 2015, an authority that will rise above that of the Chief of Customs, is calling the shots. There are too many who are in that position of power. And perhaps the answer to this question may answer the community's curiosity as to why Governor Eddie Calvo himself fought harder for the placement of Eric Kalashis to be the Director of Customs than any other member of his cabinet. Far more vociferously than he ever fought for either Benita Magnolia to be the Director of Administration, and far greater than he fought for a former member of his inner circle, former senior advisor Henry Titano, to be the Director of Economic Development. If the answer does not rise that far up, or if it does, but it hangs on the word of a chief of staff or a deputy chief of staff or even a lieutenant governor or the man and the woman underneath him, then we need to ask who persuaded them to use their authority in that way. Perhaps they didn't know and they didn't ask, especially if doing something so simple that an initial on a piece of paper could suffice in exchange for a campaign contribution or help with a dire family or financial situation. The anchor of this criminal enterprise is found somewhere in a small circle of the political elite, and that anchor will be weighed down heavily by wealth or loyalty in one form or fashion. The drug lord behind the supply is not whom we should worry. Because when that drug lord is done with business, he or she will be replaced by the next drug lord. It is this person or group of people's connections to the authorities who guarantee the transit of shipments who make 96% of the drug supply possible. Knowing this, something Governor Audi Calvo very much is aware of. Is it any wonder why the governor has poured and celebrated so many resources into the Mandana Drug Task Force to siege drugs from the streets in countless raids when he is perfectly capable of taking them from two ports of entry? Is there an even more damning link among those raids on our streets that haven't made more than a pebble-sized dent into the drug supply? Because illegal or not, the sale of methamphetamine is a business. The government regulates business. And when it comes to the black market, the government is quite capable of regulating the business of one set of owners to the advantage of another set of narcotic businessmen. So when we ask ourselves who Henry Alvin Dia is, and how he came to possess so much power and influence as to orchestrate an entire federal investigation away from what could have been the actual breaking of the drug supply on Guam and into the entrapment of a couple who had nothing to do with that drug supply. 
nearly 6,000 pounds of meth compared to eight pounds. It's important to note two idioms that oftentimes we face in our personal lives. First, you'll be judged by the company you keep. Second, and in tandem with the first, don't judge a book by its cover. This is the company Mr. Alvandia has kept over the years. It is why he had a small shop running straight out of Mr. Scambleri's nightclub, Ralphie's. It's why people didn't think twice about the immense power he held at customs, or why Mr. Alvandia was allowed into the governor's senior staff meetings without question and apparently with the approval of the governor's chief of staff. It's why when questioned about his assets to determine if he qualified for the use of the federal public defender so that he wouldn't spend a dime on his own defense, there were people in the waiting willing to attest to the transfer of his assets of a lavish lifestyle that is unbelievable for a mid-management government bureaucrat to have. It is why Mr. Alvindia was able to get his job back at Customs after his termination from the U.S. Customs for the misuse of government resources. And it is why Mr. Alvindia left Guam Customs as an untarnished employee with full retirement benefits right and to be re-employed in the same position he held even though he is a convicted felon by the federal government for crimes that were committed within and upon the very agency he has the right to return to. Where is Mr. Alvandia now? According to public postings by a local nightclub and bar frequented by the island's law enforcement, Mr. Alvandia is a special friend of the business. Though it is unclear what that means according to the terms of his pre-sentencing release, but through these past three years, he has remained a free man. And on that precipice of freedom from his debt to society for masterminding the largest police corruption conspiracy in the island history, we may never know whether he works there or if his assets are under any type of scrutiny by the U.S. attorney who has refused to allow transparency into his financials. The basis of his use of taxpayer funded federal public defender resources to represent him. Yes, Mr. Alvin Diaz's corruption extends that far out of reach of justice. There is a vast network of the rich and the powerful of our island at all levels of society and political power who seem all too eager to protect him. These people are men and women whom our society has been conditioned, even by the suck up forces of the news media, whose job it is to expose the truth as our greatest protection against the corruption and abuse of power to see these people as somehow above the drug trade and all the ugliness that colloquially is represented by the 28-year-old toothless, jobless single mother, single mother of eight kids, dressed raggedly and with a naked toddler perched on her hip. But somewhere among these pictures of the elite and the powerful rests the link to taking down 96% of the drug trade. This is the person who has pulled the strings that made Henry Alvin Dia the person of influence he continues to be despite his federal conviction. This is the political authority who gives Mr. Alvandia the air of arrogance he is able to carry to the witness stand in the Martinez and Moser case when attorney David Lujan asked him when he became a corrupt cop and he responded, quote, when I got caught, end quote. This is the man or the woman who Mr. Alvandia and likely Mr. Scambaluri is protecting. When you consider what could happen to Mr. Alvandia if he fails to protect this monster, it helps to understand why he would go through such lengths to dupe the federal government into diverting its attention to Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser. If we were to judge Mr. Alvandia by the company he keeps, we would be forced to believe that his corruption was for charity and righteousness. But underneath the cover of that book is a monster we never saw who managed to convince society to vilify the types that resemble the 28-year-old toothless wonder when she and the thousands of others who struggle with addiction against the force of government operations rife with police corruption are the victims of this monster's abuse of power and likely greed. The rich get richer and the poor, they are labeled addicts and thrown into jail so that no one believes them. Yet here we are with no one with the authority to do something and no other media outlet investigating to hold officials accountable, watching the start of a second trial against the couple meant to scapegoat the failed objectives of the investigation launched to bring down the supply of the drugs to this island. But at least the Calvo family benefited by removing their competition and the sale of cigarettes in this market, while at the same time evading the same taxes 
that made illegal trafficking of Marlboro so attractive in the customs corruption scandal. Where is the U.S. Attorney's Office in all of this? Is it possible that a man known for his overzealous ways to end corruption on Guam, Assistant U.S. Attorney Fred Black, was involved in any such conspiracy? After all, when agents forgot to turn off the tapes, HSI agent Erwin Farron and FBI agent Gary Hewitt can be heard in a recording praising Fred Black for how Mr. Black facilitated the investigation into Martinez and Moser and how happy they would be to receive over $200,000 each and how many prostitutes they could buy with that money. Perhaps this explains why not once but twice Mr. Black felt it necessary to state for the record his late involvement in the trial and that he only participated in about four hours of examination of the witnesses. The majority of the trial was prosecuted by former assistant U.S. attorney Clyde Lemon, who during the first part of the trial and during pre-trial conference witnessed government agent after government agent lie on the witness stand under oath. It was Lemons, by an amazing display of ethics uncharacteristic among most, who ran down the claim by the defense that Special Agent Erfel Matanguian was allegedly lying on the stand about the existence and use of a GPS tracker in the case. His clients, officers of the law and of the court, who reportedly lied and could have dealt a fatal blow to his own case, concealed the existence of this crucial piece of evidence. He could have joined the conspiracy in order to protect his conviction record or spare him the embarrassment or the professional hint, but he didn't. He brought the truth before the court and the evidence was admitted, along with the reported perjury that went before and after it. And even if the defense wants to argue that there is no way of knowing if crooked cops deeply involved in the entrapment scheme switched out whatever was in those buckets with methamphetamine to seal the conviction, the grossest form of tampering with evidence. There is something about our laws and the rules governing conduct of the court and the prosecution that many people are unaware of. The surest example of this was cited by Judge Gatewood in allowing evidence where there was a preponderance of proof that the buckets of methamphetamine in the Martinez and Motor case was tampered with. The court, by case law citing Dale versus Straub from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, directs the court to presume that officers of the law are telling the truth. Yet scandal after scandal throughout the country, from Englewood in Chicago, Tampa, Omaha to Alabama's Watergate and the story of an old woman knocked over by the police in Santa Clara in an unlawful search of her home that resulted in nothing but a collusion of lies against this woman tell us that courts need to be far more discerning in allowing testimonies by officers with a habit of lying from the evidence jurors will see. The police lie on the witness stand and there's nothing the defendant can do about it because the jury is instructed to treat what the police say as gospel truth. Yet just recently, on August 20, before the court of Judge Anita Sokola, police officer Benny Babauta was found to have allegedly perjured himself on the stand in a criminal drug trial. That would be the second time Babauta was found to have reportedly committed perjury. And not only is he still allowed on the witness stand, he still has a job as an alleged corrupt cop. And he hasn't been prosecuted for a crime the Attorney General's office wouldn't hesitate for a second to charge the rest of us with. And in case one wonders whether any of these acts of collusion involve federal agents and even the FBI, you'd be right. Guam wouldn't be the first place where it happened. As a matter of fact, the Justice Department can't get a break to help restore the integrity it lost when the story of a criminal conspiracy within the FBI itself exposed to the world that the American justice system at its highest levels is wanting of reform and policing of its own. But our legal system is slow to action as thousands become its victim every year. It's a phenomenon of our criminal justice system that goes widely unsaid and has become a nearly irreversible culture of conduct. In fact, that culture is so strong that it is even written as law into case law after case law since the Supreme Court made a departure stating four decades ago from the legal reforms of the Warren Court. This has spilled over to the rules of evidence and criminal procedure. And in a cultural and mindless way, we as a society have accepted and many times celebrated what amounts to the reversal of rights and power away from us 
and to the government. We are a society that sees our own people through the lens of cowboys and Indians. Even though we know that this perception was created by the government in order to assuage our collective guilt for the injustice committed against whoever was the villain of the day for Uncle Sam. This isn't just an editorial piece from the Candid News Group. About the same time that the government effectuated its conspiracy and arrested Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser in California, a federal jurist by the name of Alex Kaczynski, who in a sigh of hope for the people of Guam and those within the jurisdiction of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, published something that the legal community does not see save for the rare lightning rod dissents of Supreme Court justices over the centuries. What this Reagan-appointed conservative jurist published in the Georgetown Law Journal has become a call to action to reform the criminal justice system and the basic mindset of the legal community that is omnipresent in the miscarriage of justice against Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser and thousands of others of our relatives and friends, many of whom we have judged harshly and shunned, who were convicted by plea agreement or trial and who truly are innocent of these crimes. Think how many entered the criminal justice system as citizens trying to get by who were falsely accused and pursued by this government and leave that system only to return to it because it was the system itself that gave birth to their criminal mind. Think how many lost their jobs and their families. Think how many children lost their fathers and mothers, all on the foundation of false and trumped up charges. Judge Kaczynski laid out what his former law clerk, Eugene Bullock, in an article published July 14, 2015, described as 12 reasons to worry about our criminal justice system. The judge takes aim at 12 fallacies that truly are embedded in our minds as doctrine in a court setting. That fingerprint evidence is foolproof. That eyewitness accounts are reliable. That even that forensic evidence is infallible. Reason to what many of you have questioned each time you hear about a confession that makes no sense. That as a country, we have to live with the guilt that countless of our citizens have gone to jail and lost everything simply because we believed that if they confessed, they must be guilty attacks the modern plea bargain, the way prosecutors conduct themselves and use their networks and ability to play with the law and with evidence to their fame and for their vendettas. And in two more points that are directly related to the Martinez and Moser case are that the police can be trusted to conduct their investigations with integrity and that the burden of proof is on the prosecution to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This point is interesting because it is what we grow up knowing about our country's criminal system but it is far from the reality in that the departure from this founding principle of freedom upon which the entire idea of this country was built should be the greatest concern to us. It is estimated that percent of the criminal cases never see a day at trial. There's a reason defense attorneys go to great lengths to convince their clients to sign plea bargains, even knowing their clients' innocence. It's because they understand that the burden at trial is not the prosecutors at all to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, with rules and legal doctrines that make it a duty, not a choice, for prosecutors to argue that lies and deceit found on part of the government is immaterial to the case at hand, or other doctrines that go by pretty names, such as harmless error of lack of prejudice, that basically strips citizens of their protections under the Bill of Rights. The jury will only ever hear what the prosecutor's theory of the crime is, and the defense will be barred from a full defense of their clients. We have regressed from our growing understanding of the foundation for the formulation of this country three centuries ago, that it is freedom we must protect, not captivity. Yet here we are living in this country with 2.3 million people incarcerated in nearly 2,000 prison facilities and more than double that number of people serving the remainder of their sentence on probation in 2016, according to the Prison Policy Initiative and the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics. Two-thirds of the people in jail are there for convictions or pre-trial detention involving nonviolent crimes. That means that some 1.8 million people wasting away in jail are serving sentences for something that caused no harm to another citizen. The land of the free and the self-proclaimed standard for affirmative action that can restore justice to the dark history of slavery in America is by far leading the world with the highest incarceration rate among any country, including the Philippines of Duterte, where President Obama was so quick to criticize for violations of human rights. But make no mistake about it, with the American people going to jail by the order of the government over 11 million times each year, slavery 
is alive and well in this country. The only differences between then and now are that the people who are confined to conditions that foster disease, violence, and the hardening, or more so the creation of the criminal mind, are no longer transported by boats to make a journey across the Atlantic. They don't have the ability to roam a large area like a plantation. And they aren't all one color, though predominantly they are the descendants of the American slave era. Our country has created, and many times with our own desire and without the facts, to trade more of our freedoms and civil liberties for a moment of safe feeling, a way for slavery to thrive that skirts the tests of violations of the Bill of Rights and the anti-slavery amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments of the Constitution. While slaves no longer are plucked from coastal African countries like vigil by vigilantes and scornful merchants, they now are arrested from their homes in this country. The plea bargain is nothing more than a remnant of slavery disguised as common law that has survived legal reform the way it has. But the worst part of slavery's magnification of the criminal justice system, aside from its morbid effect on our society and upon millions of families, is who the modern day plantation owners are. In the 19th century, the American government split in two and we fought a civil war to stop the plantation of owners from having any more slaves and forbid the practice from forming in the northern states. Today, the government itself is the lone plantation owner having the monopoly of the slave trade. Our modern version of indentured servitude is celebrated in news releases by lawmakers who fail at their jobs to budget our money the right way and scapegoat prisoners into human resources that would not withstand any test of fair or even safe labor practices. Yes, it's true that sometimes criminals go free because the people trying to bring them to justice violated their constitutional rights. But we expect criminals to be criminals because they break the law. We shouldn't expect that the people who are on the side of the law get to break the law as well. And in this case, the trial of Raymond Martinez and his wife, Juanita Kiribo Moser, this is about more than criminals getting away with drug smuggling based on the argument that their rights were violated. This is about their rights being violated so that two innocent people could be framed by the very government that is supposed to be protecting their rights. And if the government can be in bed with a corrupt criminal like Henry Alvin Villa, who won't ever spend a day in jail with the conviction of two innocent people for a crime the government designed and framed them for, protected by rules of prosecutorial conduct that force either pleas or near certain conviction without the burden of proof falling on the defense. And if the government can do this to Mr. Martinez and Ms. Moser based on a system designed to do just that and by the mandate of the case law, look the other way at the indiscretions of those with the greatest power and the ever-growing power of the government. And the news group's entire reason for investigating this story and bringing it to you tonight is to let you know that it can happen to you too. We welcome every contribution to this story in the interest of finding the truth. Posted to our website within minutes of this initial posting of this recording will be the written story of what we just presented along with the trial transcripts and other documents from which we base the investigation. At Candid News, we subscribe to the theory that there are three sides to every story. There's a side that largely is covered by our competitors. Then there's the proverbial other side of the story that hardly is covered and lends to the fact that the underdogs can never get a fair day in court. And then, then there's the third side, the product of the journalist's look into the facts which doesn't end with the publication of the story, but only starts a conversation that eventually and hopefully will lead to the truth, truth of the matter. This three-part series into the Alvindia corruption scandal now becomes the third side of the story of two key issues necessary to justice according to our society's morals and beliefs, criminal and political corruption, and substance abuse. You will find all three sides of the story on our website, www.candidnews.com with links published on our Facebook page and Instagram feed at Candid News. We bring you the news and invite you to the search for the truth from our studios in Guam and bid you buenas noches, zen manalas y dudes. Because at Candid, the light eliminates the way to the truth.
ได้ไหม